what you're gonna do. You can't fight the future. Wrestling God. ProWrestlingRadio.com presents. Are you talking to me? Pro Wrestling Radio. Live. Online. You think The Rock actually cares? What is he doing here? Oh, it's true. I'm bringing everybody with me. The Rock That's hard time. The be the man. Call in with a question or comment. Six. One. Can you feel it? I hate your ever. Hold oh, the damn soul. Hold three. At 1-877-800-8834. That's how I roll! You're sex not the big dead! Come get some! Because I've done all of that! And now your host of the show. The king is back on his throne. Eric. Gargiulo. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. Welcome to a very special Memorial Day edition of Pro Wrestling Radio, and a show that I am very excited about. So let's not waste any time. Let's bring up today's guest. We will have him for the entire program today, and at approximately 12.30, we will open up the phone lines for your questions for my guest, the guy that I have routinely on interviews have said is my favorite guest that I've ever had on here and I have said it and that is documented making his fourth appearance on the show unequivocally professional wrestling's living legend and former two-time triple WF world heavyweight champion Bruno Sammartino. Bruno welcome back to the program. Well thank you very much Eric it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be on your show and thank you for the kind words. Oh absolutely it's always an honor having you here and uh, always the first question I ask you is how you doing you still doing those morning runs yes I still maintain six days uh, three uh, days a week I do uh, road work and three days a week up I'm iron <laughs> some days my day of rest but not really that's the day I love to put you around the house with the grass or the shrubberies and all that kind of stuff right now I saw some pictures of you from um, some conventions last year and it looks like you you lost some weight um, uh, right now, uh, about 217, 218, somewhere around there. Wow. I, I, I don't think at, at your age there is a man in better shape in this country that I've ever seen. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Thank you. I, I do work at it hard because, as you know, in wrestling all those years, I did uh, sustain some some injuries to where I'd have some back surgeries, hip surgery, knee surgeries. So I've done a lot of rehab on my own, and I believe I'm a strong believer that if you work out, uh, work out well and hard and uh, watch your diet to a certain degree, keep your weight under control, that you're, you're, the benefits are going to be there for you. Right, right. Um, and again, we're talking to Bruno Sammartino. Um, speaking of injuries, what was the injury that you had back in uh, 1968 that uh, forced you to stop using the backbreaker as your finish? Well, I, I had a number of uh, injuries. One was in my back uh, that uh, stopped me. Because remember, I was when I used a backbreaker. For example, if you remember these names, Bull Ramos, you mm -hmm. know, he was 365 pounds. Wow. Uh, Klondike Bill, another 370 pounder. Uh, you know, uh, Jess Ortega was uh, oh, close to 400 pounds. And you know, uh, uh, taking a lot of hard falls and then picking these big guys up like that. I did some uh, uh, some uh, vertebrae damage uh, on my back and I found that uh, I started having back problems way back in the 60s, late 60s mm. and so I kind of uh, got away from those kind of power moves because in all honesty it took an awful lot of strength to, to, to do those kind of things and it would put an awful lot of stress on your back. Right, Was that is that what you think over the years that, um, that has absorbed the, mo the most uh, amount of punishment, your back? Yeah, in my case, uh, no question, because when uh, I, one of the world-renowned neurosurgeons by the name of Dr. James Mar uh, Maroon, who did the surgeries on me, he told me that uh, he could see how hard I had trained and the kind of condition I was in, but he also saw the tremendous kind of abuse that mm. the back took. And when he did the, the, the couple of surgeries, he had to remove a total of 16 uh, uh, spurs on my back wow. and uh, three vertebrae 
Blu-ray set had been removed. And I still, you know, uh, just a, a lot, a lot of uh, problems that uh, to this day I'm in much, much better shape. But to tell you that I'm totally pain-free, it wouldn't be accurate either. But thank God. I mean, I'm, I'm right. doing great. I work out and everything else. Right, right. Absolutely. Speaking of, uh, of lifting heavy guys, is it true that um, when you when you lifted Haystacks Calhoun, that's that's really what turned your career around? Well, it, it certainly helped me tremendously because up to that point, I couldn't uh, get any kind of a break. I, I just uh, couldn't couldn't get a break. I mean, no promoter wanted to take a chance in put me as a headliner, even though they thought that uh, certain things about me they were impressed as far as my strength, my physical appearance and that. But in those days, they'd rather continue on with established names. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty hard to get established if somebody <laughs> doesn't give you a break. Right. So when I picked up a stack Calhoun, uh, then, uh, you know, it got such a tremendous reaction that I became known as the strong guy uh, from Abruzzi, Italy, who picked up Calhoun. And no question that that did help me considerably from that time forth. Right, right, absolutely. Now, what what do you remember? How, how did you wind up meeting Vince McMahon Sr. for the first time? Was it through Frank Tunney? No, not at all. Uh, I, I was here in Pittsburgh. I had uh, I was competing. I, I was doing both amateur wrestling and professional wrestling. Mm. I, and I mean uh, uh, amateur wrestling and amateur uh, weightlifting champ okay. uh, competition. And I had been in Oklahoma City where I became the North American weightlifting ch uh, title I won. And when I was here in Pittsburgh, I was on a television show from a fellow that uh, that read in the paper that I'd won the contest. And while I was on that show, a gentleman by the name of Rudy Miller was in town from Washington D.C. because the following day on a Saturday they would do studio wrestling here in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and he happened to be here the night before and he was saw on TV while I was being interviewed about this weightlifting contest that I won and the gentleman asked me if I was still also working out with the you know the wrestling part mm -hmm. and so when this uh, Rudy Miller heard about me doing both weightlifting and wrestling he inquired at the studio if anybody knew who I was and it happened that one of the guys, a guy by the name of John Cartonis, who went to high school with me, he says, yeah, he says, I live in the same street as Bruno. And this Rudy Miller asked him if he would uh, uh, ask me to come down the following week, the following Saturday, because it was a live TV show every Saturday here. And the following week I went down there, they looked me over, he looked me over real good, and he asked me if I would uh, come to Washington. He wanted to let somebody meet me, which was Vince McMahon Sr. in Tootsman. Mm. And they took me to an arena with a couple of guys I didn't know. They wanted to see what I could do, couldn't do. And I worked out in the ring with them, and they seemed pretty impressive. And that's when they set me down and said, I would you like to become a professional wrestler. Mm. And, and it, that's how it started. Gotcha. Now, now during, uh, during your height uh, of your career, did you ever, I, I never asked you this before, but did you ever wind up meeting Frank Sinatra or, or any of those Rat Pack guys during your did career? Did I ever meet him? Yeah. Oh my goodness, I knew them all. I was, I became good friends with uh, Julie Rizzo, if you remember that name. Okay. That was Sinatra's right hand man. He had the nightclub in New York, uh, called Julie's. And through him, yeah, my goodness, I, I, I was in Frank Sinatra's company at least a dozen times, if not more. So I got to know Frank, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, what's his name, Lawford. Okay. Uh, I got to know, uh, uh Richard Conti. I don't know if you remember him, the actor, because he's the one got with Frank a good Bit. And uh, we used to, after a Madison Square Garden show, when they, whenever they would be in town, Jilly would always uh, make sure he sent a driver for me, and I would join them uh, right at Jilly's, you know, for, for the evening. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's good stuff right there. Now, um, in doing uh, some research when I was having you uh, back on the show here, I saw that you worked, I don't know if it was once or you worked more than once with Ray Stevens in California for Roy Shire. Yeah, I wrestled the uh, Ray not only in California several times, but then here in New York. Oh, okay. Uh, in Boston, and uh, I forget all the towns, but I wrestled Stevens a lot of times. He's another guy I have a lot of respect for. Uh, Stevens was very, very good in the ring. Yeah, I was going to ask you what your memories were of wrestling him, because a lot of people even today talk about him as one of the great workers of that era. Absolutely, without question, he certainly was. Okay, now, I understand that you had a, a there was supposed to be a big rematch scheduled in 63 after you defeated Buddy Rogers with Buddy at Roosevelt Stadium, but it wound up being you and Gorilla Monsoon. What was the story behind that? Did he pull out of it or? Who, Buddy Rogers? Yeah. No, there was never uh, a rematch scheduled with. Uh with Buddy Rogers. I don't know if they let the publicity or something, but no, there was because uh, 
remember, a lot of people don't remember this, but I wrestled Buddy in a non-title match on TV two weeks before that Madison Square Garden match. Oh. And it went the same way. The match lasted about, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds where I took a back break. And then we went in the garden. Uh, the match, about, I heard you announce from the beginning where McMahon's all in 55 seconds. That right. was 48 seconds. <laughs> and uh, no, that was the end uh, with Buddy. There was bad, there was always bad feelings with between me and Buddy Rogers. I don't know if you ever knew that or not. But oh, oh yeah, the first, the first time I had... Like Huh? I was going to say, the first time you were on the show here, you talked a lot about it. Yeah, we just, uh, you know, I, I, we just did not like each other. As simple as that. We just did not like each other. Uh, the, the, you know, a lot of people have no idea the, that match even came about, but it was a story in itself. But, but no, after that, that was the end of Buddy Rogers, yeah. as far as his career. Now, a, a guy that, that you had um, that you had a big run with, uh, Billy Graham, um, I understand you guys did some really big business on the rematches, on the title rematch. Um, around the country. As a matter of fact, you had a very legendary cage match here in Philadelphia, um, which I think was a couple days before he wound up dropping the belt to Bob Backlund, actually. Um, Bill, Billy Graham, uh, Billy Graham's put out a book, and Billy Graham's done a lot of interviews, and Billy Graham tells a story, and, I, you know, I'm asking you whether, you know, it's true or not, or, or what, your th th what your take on this is. Okay. Billy Graham says that you guys wrestled each other in Philly a couple days before the Bob Backlund match. And Billy was starting to get upset because business was great. You and he were doing great business, and he was thinking, you know, that he wasn't ready yet to drop the belt to Bob Backlund, especially with the business you guys were doing. And you, being around the business longer than Billy, um, is seeing how what Buddy Rogers tried to pull with you when he tried to pull the heart attack story, and Dory, Dory Funk tried to pull the same thing with Jack Briscoe, when he uh, he had a truck accident before he was supposed to drop the belt to Jack Briscoe, and Billy says that you advised him um, out of this to work a knee injury so he wouldn't have to drop the belt to Backlund, and we all know how that turned out anyway. Is that true? So Billy said that. Yeah. In his book. Well, he said that in other interviews. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> a pretty good story. I certainly have no recollection of anything like that. <laughs> it's a great story. That's why if it was true, I was hoping to, hoping to get some comments from you on it, so there's no truth to that. No, huh? I've never, no. That's, 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 uh, that's news to me. <laughs> okay. That's news to me. I, I, that's the first, uh, first time I ever heard that story. Okay, okay. Um, and um, speaking of, uh, of interviews, Larry Zabisco did an interview recently, and he was asked about the heat between you and he. And he said he feels partly responsible because he said that you're a little mad at him because when you guys did the program in the early 80s with each other, he said that he kind of went over your head and went to the office and put a lot of pressure on you to do it, and you didn't really want to do it, but you kind of felt pressure to do it. Is that accurate? No, that's not accurate. The reason why there was bad feelings was because... Uh, uh, we were supposed to have a workout. He, the, the idea was not a wrestling match. Mm -hmm. The idea was a workout. And I don't know if you remember the oh, yeah. workout. I do. It was supposed to have been just a workout, and the idea was that he felt that at that stage of our lives, I was over the hill, and he was coming into his prime, and he felt that if we had a workout to where we're trying to outmaneuver each other, that people would get new respect for him and not just look at him as a protege of Bruno San Martino, but perhaps as his equal or even better. And, and he was honest. He says, you know, Bruno, he says, not because uh, I'm saying I was better than you or anything. He says, but let's face it, age catches up with all of us. He says, and it has caught up with you. He says, you're not what you used to be. He says, but I'm coming into my prime. And he said, so... So he said, uh, uh, it's only in normal that I should, he said, be able to outmaneuver you a little bit. And I told him, I says, well, if you can outmaneuver me in, in this workout thing, fine, but don't think that I'm going to help you with it. That's because I have a lot of pride and I'm going to look as good as I can look. Right. We agreed with that. But when he got a little frustrated because people started getting him a little bit, what I got mad, a lot of people don't know, is he really clobbered me with that chair. Mm. I mean, he, he, he hit me so damn hard that I was really bleeding bad, and I did. I got, I got very upset and angry with that, and I lost a lot of respect, and I, I after that, I just had a, a completely different uh, feeling about Larry. Right. So a lot of so a lot of that workout then, uh, in terms of what they were called today, would be a shoot then. Oh, yeah. It was just strictly, uh, he wanted to show, it wasn't like we went out there trying to beat each other. Right. It was trying to outmaneuver each other, just so that he, he felt that people could uh, respect and appreciate his talent. 
Americans by outmaneuvering me. Mm, okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense then, uh, as as co in contrast to what he had said in his uh, interview. Well, I don't know what he said because I've never heard of any interviews. I'm just telling you yeah. what I what I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And again, we're speaking to the legendary. Bruno Sammartino. On a happier note, what are uh, some of the memories of your program with uh, Cowboy Bill Watts? Oh boy, that was so early on in the career. That was in the 60s, mm -hmm. in the middle 60s, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bill was a big guy, you know, he was a 300 pounder, and a uh, strong guy, uh, could move well for his size. And I, I thought we had some good matches, but to, to, I have to be real frank with you, to say that those matches stick out in my head like some of the ones I had with uh, Ivan Koloff mm. or Kowalski, I, I wouldn't be truthful of me because, again, you know, it was in the uh, middle 60s, maybe, I don't know, 65 or somewhere around there. I don't remember the exact years. Mm. But they were good matches. Uh, the, don't, I'm not taking anything away from Bill, uh, for God's sakes, because he was very good for a big guy. Mm. But uh, my matches with Koloff and Kowalski and even a few with Tanaka, the, the, and even Monsoon, if you remember, for a guy for over 400 pounds, he could move well, and I had some pretty good uh, uh, matches with him. So Hans Mortier I enjoyed because we used to do a lot of wrestling when mm. I wrestled there. There was a lot of good, clever wrestling moves, and I loved that. Mm. In fact, what I don't like when I see myself, what I don't see myself too often now, some of these tapes that are out there, they're always like of a blow-off match. What I mean that blow-off match is like with Koloff, let's say. Maybe the first match we ever did would have been great, you know, a lot of arm dragging, a lot of good uh, drop the holds and scoop slams and backdrops. And but then as, by the time the second or third match came, it would become a brawl. Right. And it seems like I see more of those kind of matches that they put on tape rather than those ones that, that led up to that brawl, so to speak. And that bothers me because I wish that people would see more of those fast moving, a lot of arm drag, a lot of great action like I did with Ray Stevens in California. Right. Uh, you know, the, I wish that there were a lot of more of those out there for people to see rather than the finale match where there was a lot of brawling and stuff. Right, right. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, speaking of that, the last time that I had you on the show, you had just um, ran into the, the WWE guys and the McMahon and everything down in Pittsburgh yeah. uh, at that time. And, and you had said on the show, you said you didn't expect much to come out of it, but your lawyer was going to listen to what they had to say and, you know, and, and right. they would take it from there. And then um, back this February, the Associated Press actually reported that you refused an invitation this year for their Hall of Fame. Um, yeah. Where do things stand with, with you and them? Oh, not good. I don't want to have anything to do with that organization or him. And I'll tell you what, you know, uh, I appreciate some of the fans that have talked to me. and They said, oh, you belong to the Hall of Fame. We'd like to see the Hall of Fame. But I wish they would understand my side of it. If you go far back enough, I've been opposed to a lot of the stuff McMahon's been doing for many, many years. For example, I was very appalled when I saw the uh, widespread of, uh, of uh, uh, drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I'm not talking about just steroids. I'm talking about drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, besides, in a lot of steroids. I was very, very appalled with that, and I was very outspoken on that. If you remember, I went away with him on one-on-one -on, -one on the uh, Donahue, uh, Donahue show. I do. The, uh, on the Larry King show or out of there. And then when he started bringing in the, the girls, the beautiful ladies, but always with a G-string or some where accents would pop, where a breast would pop out. And this was, of course, all to get exciting for kids 13, 14 years old that they, 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 they're going to keep coming to the arena to, to, to see a strip show is what it amounted to. And then all the vulgarity came in. Well, the point is that I was so outspoken about all of this stuff, so outspoken about it, now, what kind of a hypocrite would I be now if I went into the Hall of Fame? That is to say that everything I was talking about, everything I knocked and resented about what he'd done to the business, uh, uh, now because I have a, an opportunity to get into the Hall of Fame, uh, it's okay. Everything was fine now. Just I'm um, in the Hall of Fame. Now, that, that by refusing it, it, it keeps me, I believe in my heart, uh, my stance stays, stays straight, that, that I'm appalled with everything that he did, and I want no part of any of it, including his Hall of Fame, which is part of it. Right, right. Well, that, again, it makes a lot of sense. Um, speaking of, of steroids, um, the, the last three appearances that I had with you here on the show, you've been very outspoken about steroids, not just in, in wrestling, but in uh, high school athletics.
athletics and college athletics. Yep. And ironically enough, that recently, all of a sudden, Congress is opening their eyes, and they've had hearings on steroids in football and baseball, but they have and and um, basketball and hockey, for that matter. And they haven't talked one iota about professional wrestling. Um, do you think that they're missing the boat with the pro wrestling? That's why I'm very turned off with people like McCain and Waxman and all these people. I'm very turned off with these people. And I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. For example, all the stuff that you're hearing now about uh, about baseball, about football, and Steve Corson, I don't know if you remember his name, he's from here in Pittsburgh, who played for the Steelers. He spoke about 95% of all the football players were on steroids. Mm -hmm. In baseball, now we know about Conseco and others who have been speaking about it so far. Now they have these congressional hearings, but there have been no deaths that we really know of. Twenty-some years ago, when I was so outspoken about the, the steroid problems, and we were on these shows that we just mentioned, like the Larry King and Daniel all that. You mean to tell me that these guys, the McCains and the Waxman, have never heard about any of this stuff? No. It was because it was professional wrestling. They didn't care. Wrestling wasn't a glamour sport like baseball, football, whatever. Now with baseball, all these congressional hearings, that, and there have not been any debts. We're in wrestling, and I'm sure you heard this yourself, Eric. There, there's supposed to have been, in the past 20 years, something like over 70 guys that have died from drug-related oh, yeah. things. Okay, my God, shouldn't that bring more attention than anything to when out that there are that many deaths that have occurred in young guys yet? Mm -hmm. In baseball, there have been no deaths that I know of in baseball. In football, they talk about La Alzado. Mm. But the point is, that in wrestling there have been uh, well, that many deaths and yet they ignored it all the time. Maybe if they paid attention 25 years ago when I was talking so much about it, maybe then they would have taken some action that maybe would have curbed the, 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 the uh, baseball, football and everything to get, in, to, to get into those drugs. Maybe they would have taken action that much earlier, the, the league themselves, to, to try to, uh, to prevent it from happening. But no, they never did. Now they're doing all this investigation, baseball, football, basketball, and still you don't hear the name wrestling amongst them, and this is where the most deaths have occurred. Does that make any sense? Oh, I, I, well, you're making a ton of sense, and um, they aren't making sense at all. That's why I use the word ironic, because all of a sudden, when people like yourself have been talking about this for year, na years, now they're opening up their eyes, and they're not even looking at wrestling. No, they're not even looking at wrestling, like I say, with all the tragedies, all the deaths that we had in this game. I just don't understand it, but it appalls me uh, with, uh, that these people are, are, are doing something about about it. Yeah, I have uh, I have a question I want to ask you, and then um, and then I'm going to take a break. But kind of two part here. Um, recently, Dusty Rhodes put out a book, and you know what's really again what's ironic is every time I have you on the show, it seems like there's somebody that just put out a book and took a shot at you. It's the craziest <laughs> thing. In the, <laughs> it's the craziest thing in the world, but it, it's true. Um, Dusty Rhodes um, took some shots at you in his book, and it, it, in my opinion, and not it, you know, and you can say what you want, but in my opinion, it came off as, as a bit of jealousy. Um, Dusty Rhodes in his book, um, in talking about you, he said that after the shows where he would come in and do the WWWF shows, and you were on the show in um, New York City, he would go to the nightclubs, and if you would be at the nightclub, he would walk in the nightclub, and everybody would leave where you are and go to get him, go to get his autograph, and you would look at him with a disgusted face. First of all, I've never been in a nightclub with Dusty Rhodes. I, I was not a nightclub person. I didn't go to nightclubs. Right. Never been in one. And I heard he also said that whenever we have an autograph session, that people would all rush to him. Believe me, I, I, I don't know if this guy's got an if he's that egotistical or, 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 or that he convinces himself of these ridiculous lies. Dusty Rhodes was never a big deal in the Northeast. When, when did he ever headline Madison Square Garden or, or any of the other big arenas around here? Not, not during my era, and he was certainly there during my era. You know, somebody else told me that he said that, and I said, all i got to say is that this guy is as sick as he is fat, because <laughs> it never happened. Right. right, and you know what's funny is, um, after those comments came out, and a lot of a lot of your fans would like post on the internet and stuff, and they would say, not only does that story not sound credible, but people that would know you would say, Bruno never even went to the nightclubs after the show. And I never did. Yeah. I never did. So I don't know why these people write this kind of garbage in their books. I don't know. Is it to sell books? Is it to, uh, I, I, I don't understand. Why do they fabricate these ridiculous stories? I, I just don't understand it. I just don't. Well, um, I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a quick break. 
But when I come back from the break, I want to ask that you can listen when we come back from the break after the commercials because I had Terry Funk on my radio show last week. Okay. And I brought this up about you, about, you know, that I didn't understand why some of these guys, like the Flares and Dusties, were taking shots at you. Yeah. And Terry Funk just had some beautiful things to say about you. So when oh, I come really? back. Yeah, I, I think you're really going to be impressed with what oh, you hear. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so um, when I come back from the break, just keep listening because right after the commercials, I'm going to go right into that and then I'll bring you up for your comments. Okay. All right, that's great. Uh, we are speaking with the living legend of professional wrestling, a former two-time WWF World Heavyweight Champion, and my favorite guest of all time, Bruno Sammartino. And we are opening the phone lines. We will start taking questions for Bruno when we come back from the break. And we're going to try and make this as efficient as possible. So when you call in and I bring you up on the air, please have your radio turned down and have your question or questions ready. And um, after you ask Bruno your questions, I'm going to ask that you drop out. We're going to cut you off and ask that you listen over the air because that way it moves the show along. We can get as many people in as possible. So when you call in and the screener asks your questions, Question, please have it ready so we can get as many people in as possible to talk to the living legend Bruno San Martino. With that said, we are listening to the show in a couple of places. One, on the internet through my website, prowrestlingradio.com, wbcb1490.com, on the air, wbcb1490 AM. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you, there is a very, very honorable man. There is a guy that uh, certainly protected his profession more than, and I don't mean this bad whenever I say it, I'm not knocking Dusty, mm -hmm. that certainly protected his profession more than Dusty, mm -hmm. certainly protected his profession more than Ric Flair, certainly protected his profession more than Hulk Hogan, but also he certainly protected his profession more than Terry Funk. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a wonderful trait, and I think that he's uh, one hell of a man, and gosh, I, I, I really mean that. He's just, he's just I've, I've always admired him to no end, you know? Yeah. As he had an opportunity, doggone near split up with uh, Vince McMahon Sr., because... Uh, so he, Baba, he met him over, you know, he met him. And by golly, whenever Bruno says, you know, and they became friends, and whenever they become friends, you become Bruno, Bruno's friends, well, he'll never let you down. He'll never forget that, you know. And uh, uh, Vince Sr. went with Anoki. Bruno says, I'm not going to do that. He went with them in New Japan. And... Uh, Bruno says, I'm not going to do that. Papa's my friend. And he went with the threat of Vince McMahon Sr. going ahead and and uh, uh, destroying his career. Yeah. Uh, if he took the belt from him, that would destroy his career. But he went with that threat. He went right over there to, to all Japan, which was Shoei Baba's company, and wrestled for him because Baba was his friend. And he would not in any way or form do anything to hurt him. And I know for a fact he went over there for a pittance of what he would, uh, what he could have gotten. And, uh, just expenses because he wanted to help the guy out because he was his friend. So how can you knock a guy like that? And now back to more pro wrestling radio and your host of the show. All right, Bruno, are you there? Yes, I'm here. What did you think of that? Well, I, I appreciate very, very much what he said. I uh, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but, you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I love the business. When I speak against the steroids and everything else and the death, it's because it pains me so deeply of the, the of what they've done to this business. But I always protected it. You're darn right I did because I, I loved it. I loved the business. I respected the fans who supported us. And I had so much respect for so many of the wrestlers. If anybody read my book, you don't hear me 
pick on individuals like uh, like that. And so uh, I, I thank Terry Funk for what he said. It's very flattering, though, for all the kind and things he said. But it's the truth. For example, in Japan, Vince McMahon and I had the wars because he was uh, yeah he was making a lot of money uh, uh, sending talent for the Inaki organization. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, how does it look for me by you going for Shoai Baba when I'm dealing with Inaki? I said, I, I, I'm sorry how it looks for you. I said, but I've known, I, I was going for, with Baba before you got in love with Inaki. And now I should change just because it serves you. I said, hey, if you don't like it, do what you want. I said, but I will only go for that organization. And I did to the very, very end. And no McMahon or anybody else was going to have me turn my back on a commitment that I made with a person. And and so, you know, uh, Funk is uh, very aware of that because later his father became the booker for Shohai Baba. Mm. And it, when Shohai Baba first started, that's right, I went there just for expenses, just to help him out because I felt that he was an honorable man. So. There's a lot now. Here's, here's a Ric Flair who knocks me. Here's a guy who's got a lawsuit for exposing himself on an airplane with airline stories. Here's a guy who was known to get loaded, go up on bars and moon everybody in the bar. Here's a guy who, who wouldn't pay his income taxes with almost threw him in jail. And Jim Crockett had to work out a deal with the government to pay, uh, to, to keep him out of jail and, and, and monthly make payments for, for taxes. Here's a guy admit of using drugs for over 20 years and this guy should be criticizing anybody absolutely absolutely and uh again we are talking to the legendary bruno sammartino i just thought bruno you know i usually have you on here and I, I bring up comments that somebody said negative and i just thought after last week when he said such touching words about you i thought you'd really appreciate that well, I do appreciate it very, very much. I, uh, I, I, yes, I. What can I tell you? Yeah. It's uh, very nice of Terry to, 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 to think, uh, feel that way about him. But he knows me for a long, long time. You know, we go yeah. way, way back, and uh, not that we've been great buddies or ever hung out or anything like that. No, but I think there's always been mutual respect because of our careers. You know. Right. Absolutely. How about we open up the uh, phone lines to the fans out there? Very good. All I right. Like I talking to the fans. Oh. Uh, I know you do, and they love talking to you. I, got, I get so many emails asking when you're coming back on the show, so this should be a lot of fun. Um, we'll bring up Ron first in Levittown. Ron, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, Ron, if you could just say hello and ask your questions, and then we'll cut you off, and then you can listen to Bruno answer on the flip side. Okay. Bruno, it's an honor to talk to you again. Thank you, Ron. And I have to say, before I ask my question, uh, if it's all right, Eric, yeah. I feel that, you know, I feel the same way you do about the wrestling today is just not what it should be. I mean, I, I follow your area. And he, my question is, what is your what is your son doing today? All right, thanks, Ron. Well, did I hear right? What is my son doing today? Yeah, David. Uh, Dave, David lives in that, uh, Georgia. He's got a wife and a daughter, and he's out of the wrestling business, obviously, and uh, and uh, he lives there, and he works there, and uh, that's, that's, you know, that's... <laughs> That's his life now. <laughs> okay, and you know what? Uh, I, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't give the phone numbers out again. I haven't given the phone numbers out there on the show. The numbers to call in are 1-888-922-2149. That's toll-free, 1-888-922-2149. And Scott is uh, hanging on hold. Scott, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I got a big, I got a, and Bruno is very... Big pleasure to talk to a living legend like you. You, you. Ain't, you ain't stuck up like Ric Flair and all those other guys that I tried meeting before. But uh, anyways, I mean, why do you think that, you know, so many wrestlers today are trying to tarnish your legacy? You carried the WWWF on your back basically for like seven years during your first reign and then for four more years during your second reign. Why do you think guys like Ric Flair and all those guys don't want to tarnish your legacy like that? Thank you, Scott. I think uh, uh, guys like Ric Flair, I, I never knew him too well uh, because uh uh, I was never around him all that much when he, uh, in, in the garden, when he first came, Crockett sent him over to give him some publicity. That's the time when I was champion. Mm -hmm. But he was preliminary. I think he wrestled a guy named Pete Sanchez. That's correct. And whenever I was in Japan, he was the, with him, he was in the preliminary and I was the headliner. I think it's strict, uh, in Ric Flair's case, I think it's strictly jealousy. He's an egomaniac. He wants to, 
to, to, to put himself up above everybody in the, in the whole world of wrestling. And I think that he thinks he can achieve that by, uh, by uh, putting others uh, who may have had a better reputation and by putting him down. I, I, I don't know any other explanation. I don't know what's in the guy's head, but uh, uh, like I say, with everything he's done and the way he's conducted himself, uh, I think that uh, that speaks volumes about what Ric Flair is all about. Is it true, Bruno, that um, when uh, when when Vince uh, Senior and Vince Junior when they were promoting the uh, Muhammad Ali Antonio Inoki event, and it wasn't selling as well as as they thought it would be, and that's putting it lightly, that Vince Senior uh, pretty much went to you and begged you to come back way earlier, earlier than than you were in shape for for that match with Stan Hansen. I got the doctors on my back, my family, because Vince McMahon was calling me at the hospital. It's after I was, re I was recuperating from my broken neck. The thing was such a disaster financially, and if anybody who remembers or who knows, it was the biggest bomb worldwide as far as uh, that match, wherever where place it was seen. Mm -hmm. And Vince McMahon Sr. told me that if he didn't make the match between me and Hanson, that he was gonna, going to bankruptcy because he had committed so much money with a fight manager named Bob Arum for the closed circuit that Vince McMahon had gotten into. They thought that the fighter versus rest would be a big bonanza. It would have been if it had been anybody but Inaki because Inaki was known in Japan, but he wasn't looked upon that big any, anywhere else. Right. And so uh, McMahon kept calling and calling, and my doctors and everybody says, you, you, you're not ready, you're not ready. Anyway, long story short, I came back just to bail him out, and we did bail him out because every place they showed the match with me and Stan Hansen on the closed circuit it was a big bonanza and not only did with Bell McMahon out but made him a lot of money at the same time right right and again we are talking to the legendary Bruno San Martino and we're going to go back to the phones Joe is hanging on Joe are you there yes I am Eric how you doing good this is Joe Heavey I know you know Joe real well Bruno yeah it's a good friend of mine Joe uh, I see Joe not once in a while when I make an appearance someplace he's, a, he's been a very very good uh, good friend absolutely and Joe's been a great friend of the show here so Joe uh, you know talk to Bruno hey Bruno you know, how you feel my friend I'm feeling pretty good, Joe, pretty good. I hope you and your family are all well. Yes, we're all doing well, Bruno. I, I shattered my uh, collarbone, but that's a long story. We'll get into that another time. I just want to know how you were feeling, and I hear um, you're coming to Philadelphia in June for the Italian Sons and Daughters yes, of America. I, was just, I just came back from Washington, D.C., where they honored me there. The, uh, the ISDA, the Italian Sons of Daughters of America, and uh, in uh, 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 26th, I believe, uh, of uh, June, I will be honored in Philadelphia. Okay, Bruno, I look forward to seeing you there, Bruno. And what's this I hear that Larry Zabisco is challenging you to a match in well, August? Funny thing, because if you if you look at uh, if you look at the website, uh, what's it called, the Wrestle Reunion uh, dot, com. dot com, you will see me there uh, responding to him, and then you'll even see me take my sweatshirt off and give a, a pose to show everybody mm. what I look like at this stage of my life. Mm, that's going to be good stuff, and we'll talk about that um, in a moment as well. Joe, I want to thank you for calling in, and I, I hope you feel better. Okay, thanks for I'm doing real good, and Bruno, I look forward to seeing you real okay, soon. Take care of yourself, Joe. And you take care, champ. Love you. Okay. Take care. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, speaking of that Wrestle Reunion event, um, that's coming up um, in uh, the summertime right here in the Valley Forge area, at the Valley Forge Convention Center. And I had I had Test on a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about who he was looking forward to seeing. Are you looking forward to seeing anybody in particular there? Well, look, I went to Tampa, and I don't want to do it. I, I, in fact, I had turned it down, because after these surgeries, I took so much time to recuperate, uh, to, to train, to, to get back in shape, and I just didn't want to travel. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the good friend, the cell correct, said to me, Bruno, please, you got to make it. You know, we're calling it the legends, all kind of stuff like that. I went, and I was thrilled to death. There were a lot of wrestlers there. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see half of them, <laughs> because I was so busy with the fans signing autographs, having photo session, question answer thing, and that's what I really loved. Uh, and so I 
devoted all my time with that more than uh, um, trying to get together with some of the wrestlers. Not that I don't want to, but mm-hmm. but I felt that this was a fans' day. This was for the fans, and that's where the time should be devoted to. And it's going to be the same thing in Valley Forge. Uh, uh, yeah, it would be nice to see some of the guys, but more importantly, this is an opportunity to be able to meet with the fans, to answer their questions, listen to their comments, or take a picture with them, or whatever it is that's going to happen. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, that's tremendous. And more information on that, by the way, can be had at WrestleReunion.com. And here on the radio show, we're going to do some more promotion with that as we, we get closer to the event. So if you want more information on that, check out the website or just keep keep listening here to the show every Saturday afternoon. I guess what we'll do is we'll bring up one last uh, caller here and then we'll take a break. So, Larry, you are on the air. Bruno, how you doing? I'm very good. How are you? All right. It's been my job. It's been my childhood with you with my dad at the Providence Civic Center. I hope you got fond memories of that place. Um, Which Civic Center? Providence? Yeah. In Rhode yeah. Island? Yeah. Oh, I sure do. Yeah. Um, my my three biggest feuds I remember when I was 12 and 13, and I got a picture of you and me when I was 12 that I'll, I hope you'll sign at Wrestle Reunion. But, I see how um, you do. Waldo Von Erich, Sparrow Therion, Bobby Duncan. Who was the best wrestler? Who was the best brawler? All right, thanks for your question, Larry. Bobby Duncan, uh, it's a name you don't hear too much about, and he was great. I absolutely loved wrestling him because he used to accomplish a lot of good wrestling moves. He was a big guy who could move real, real well. Uh, Von Eric, I think, uh, probably uh, more brawling, uh, but not that he couldn't wrestle because he certainly could. And with Spiros Harry on there, he used combination, some wrestling and some brawling. Uh, but out of the three, I'd have to... I'd, uh, for my, for me, the best match it would be with Bobby Duncan. All right, that's tremendous. And Bruno, I'm gonna ask if you can hang on. We're gonna go to our final break. Okay. All right, tremendous. We are talking to wrestling's living legend, professional wrestling's living legend, Bruno Sammartino. And also, as well, more information you can get on Bruno can be had at brunosammartino.net. That is his website, and there are banners up on my website, prowrestlingradio.com, as well. If you need more information on that. I also uh, want to plug real quick, and I'll talk more about this at the very end of the show, that next Saturday I'm going to be in Trenton, New Jersey for Heritage Day at the Bank of America on West State Street. And we will be joined over the telephone by former WWE Tag Team Champion Matt Hardy. And we will have a live mic out there. So if you want to ask Matt a question, come on out to uh, Trenton. I'll have some stuff to give away. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And that's next Saturday, June the 4th in Trent, New Jersey at the Bank of America. You're listening to the show in a couple of places. One on the internet through my website, prowrestlingradio.com, wbcb1490.com, on the air, wbcb1490 AM. Another tremendous body slam. The fans behind the young Bruno Sammartino all the way. Bruno, pouring it on now, get monsoon. Bruno Sammartino with his toughest chest to date against this giant of a man. Sammartino in six and coming on strong against Jelikowski. And again, we are speaking with professional wrestling's living legend, Bruno Sammartino. Let's bring up Ted, who's been hanging on for a little while. Ted, are you there? Hey, how's it going, Eric? Uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. The floor is yours. Yeah, i got to say it's an honor and a privilege to be talking to someone uh, like Bruno Sammartino, a champion of his integrity. And uh, I just have a question, uh, two questions. One, why did uh, 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 Mr. Sammartino, why did he never wrestle heel? And two... Why the, um, in other words, uh, Vince's father, Vince's, uh, Vince Sr. and Tootsmont, how is, uh, Vince 
Jr. different from those individuals? Not just hang up and listen to that uh, question, but it, like I said, it's an honor to see someone of that kind of integrity, and I love the stance of why he isn't going into the Hall of Fame, and actually it's not legitimate until someone like him gets into it. Well, so thank, thank you very you. much, Ted. Uh, thank you very much, Ted. Those are very kind words. As far as to compare Vince McMahon Jr. with Sr. and Toots Mond, Toots Mond, uh, to those who, who may not know who he was, he was truly one of the greatest wrestlers of his era. He was a tough, tough guy, great wrestler, was partners with Vince McMahon Sr. A lot of people didn't even know that, uh, but he was. Uh, but uh, uh, Vince McMahon uh, uh, Sr., yeah, I'm not going to tell you that it was a 100% smooth ride, but but uh, we, we had our differences, but overall, yeah, I respect respected him too because he he wanted the best for wrestling and so forth and so on. He really was. He was for wrestling. His son, how can I compare him? If his father was alive hmm. and saw what his son did, I don't know what his father would do because I know darn well the way I knew Vince McMahon Sr., he would never, never, never have approved of what his, of what his son did. And you know what? I'm sorry to say, but I didn't hear Ted's first comment about somebody that wrestled or did not wrestle. I missed that. Oh, he asked asked um, why you never went heel at any time in your career. Heel? Yeah. Well, I, sometimes I think I looked more like one when I was wrestling the Kowalskis, and uh, I think I was as much of a heel with my uh, action in the ring as any of them were. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, over the last um, couple of years, well, Harley Race uh, said, I think it was about a year or so ago, he said uh, right around 1983 when he was NWA World Heavyweight Champion, Yeah. he said that Vince Jr. made him an offer to jump with the NWA belt at that time, and I had Dusty Dusty Rose on the show here um, a couple of weeks ago, and he said that that wasn't uncommon for other promoters to make offers to champions to jump with the other, you know, promotions belt. Um, did anybody at, at, during any of your reigns from like the AWA or NWA ever uh, make you an offer to jump with Vince's belt? No, there was there was talk where they actually had meetings when Fez was champion. Mm. Uh, he he wasn't he was getting old, uh, you know, as we all got old in time, <laughs> and, and uh, he wasn't effective anymore. And they felt that they wanted a unification of the title to where I was going to be uh, that. But uh, uh, they could never get together as far as uh, what's his name, um, Sam Mashnik, who was the mm. head of the uh, NWA. He needed like seventeen, eighteen day, uh, days a month on on the champion because of all the commitments he had with the NWA members around the country. Vince McMahon, who felt that he had the biggest arenas anywhere in the country in all his major cities, and he needed 17, 18 days. So they were they were battling back and forth who was going to get how many dates on me. And what happened was that when I found out about it, because I was never in any of the meetings, I held the meeting of my own with Toots Mond, Vince McMahon, and a guy named Willie Gilsenberg, and I told them, I said, I don't care how you people divide my time uh, around the country. I says, but know this. I says, my parents are still living and they're up there in age. I never get to see my wife and my son. I says, some days have got to be mine. I said, wrestle me six days a week. Put me on the road and I'll go for it. I said, but four days a month are mine. And uh, that really uh, killed it because yeah. now they had like 26 and 27 days to work with. In no way that they were going to uh, get enough dates uh, to please both. So that's when Tutsmond uh, told Vince McMahon, he said, why do you even care about that? Because we have our own territory. We've become number one worldwide as far as recognition. He says, let them be them and let us be us. And that's the way, and that's what happened. Um, I only have you for another minute here, and then, and then, um, then I have to wrap up. But real quick, um, Captain Albano uh, was on uh, my show a couple of years ago, and he said it was you that told him he should move from wrestler to manager. Is that true? Well, he wasn't doing that good as a wrestler. He wasn't doing well enough. But I noticed that he was a pretty good talker. He was always talking, and he and he was there was a certain style of his that I felt that he could be very effective because some wrestlers they weren't well in promoting themselves. For example, if they were going to wrestle in Madison Square Garden, let's say against me when I was champion, mm -hmm. and they couldn't promote themselves on interviews. And I thought Albano, well, 
uh, uh, was at such a gift gap that the, and his wrestling skills were really uh, mediocre. Uh, I thought he'd be a better manager, and I one time suggested that they should do that, and I even told Vince McMahon, I said, this guy would be much better manager than he would a wrestler. And uh, and uh, so they tried him out, and uh, as they say, the, the, <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> well, Bruno, I just want to thank you so much again uh, for coming on the show. This is your fourth time, and uh, hopefully we'll have you soon for a fifth. I hope so. It's always nice doing the show with you, and I truly, truly enjoy talking to all your listeners. I really mean that. Oh, they absolutely love it, and I know there are a lot of them out there that didn't have a chance today, so hopefully we'll have you back soon so we can give all of them a chance to get into you as well. Anytime. Just let me know. All right, Bruno. Thank you very much, and have a happy and safe Memorial Day weekend. And the same to you and all your listeners. Thank you, Bruno. Good luck. Take care. That is the legendary Bruno Sammartino right there, former WWWF World Heavyweight Champion. And it's true. Um, you know, I, I um, through the other projects that I do, I get to do a lot of interviews in the media and things like that. And they always ask me who my favorite guest is. And I always say Bruno because he just talks straight from his heart. He he doesn't give you any candy-coated answers and doesn't dance around anything. He just gives you the straight stuff. And I love that about Bruno Sammartino. What a great man. And, uh, again, all apologies to anybody that couldn't get through today to talk to Bruno. We'll definitely have him back on at some point. And he's also going to be available at that Wrestle Reunion convention. So you can not only ask Bruno a question, you can ask him yourself at the WrestleMania convention and meet him, get an autograph, and all that wonderful stuff. I want to thank Chris out there for uh, being the first line of defense and uh, handling the phones out there today. I want to thank Bill Melody for making things happen on this end of the dial. And uh, following me today will be Phillies baseball, and Bill will return. Uh, Bill, maybe will squeeze in a little music after that and uh, country music, and he'll be back tomorrow morning from 6 to 10 a.m. with the best country music in the business. And don't forget... June the 4th, that's next Saturday, I'm in Trenton, New Jersey, along with Denny O and the Polka Boys before me at the Bank of America. And I'm going to be right there doing the show. I'm going to have stuff to give away. I'm going to have an open mic as well because Matt Hardy, formerly of the WWE, will be my guest next week. And we have so much to talk about with Matt. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I'm not going to have the phone lines open. So if you want to ask Matt a question, you're going to have to come out to Trenton, New Jersey. And again, ProWrestlingRadio.com is my website. ProWrestlingRadio.com. We'll have the Bruno Sammartino interview up in audio and transcription sometime in the next few days. And that's ProWrestlingRadio.com. Terry Funk is up there. Dusty Rhodes and Tester up there as well. But they're going to be going down in order to allow the bandwidth. And that'll about do it for me. Have a happy and safe Memorial Day weekend. And to the troops out there, thank you very much. We'll see you next Saturday from Trenton, New Jersey. One of the few radio stations in America that's still live 24-7. 1490 WBCB, Levittown, Trenton. Work out, uh, work out well and hard and uh, watch your diet to a certain degree, keep your weight under control, that you're, you're, the benefits are going to be there for you. Right, right. Um, and again, we're talking to Bruno Sammartino. Um, speaking of injuries, what was the injury that you had back in uh, 1968 that uh, forced you to stop using the backbreaker as your finish? Well, I, I had a number of uh, injuries. One was in my back uh, that uh, stopped me. Because remember, I was when I used to backbreaker. For example, if you remember these names, Bull Ramos, you mm -hmm. know, he was 365 pounds. Wow. Uh, Klondike Bill, another 370 pounder. Uh, you know, uh, Jess Ortega was uh, oh, close to 400 pounds. And you know, uh, taking a lot of hard falls and then picking these big guys up like that. I did some uh, uh, some uh, vertebrae damage uh, on my back and I found that uh, I started having back problems way back in the 60s, late 60s mm -hmm. and so I kind of uh, got away from those kind of power moves because in all honesty it took an awful lot of strength to, to, to do those kind of things and it would put an awful lot of stress on your back. Right, Was that is that what you think over the years that, um, that has absorbed the, mo the most uh, amount of punishment, your back? Yeah, in my case, uh, no question, because when uh, I, one of the world-renowned neurosurgeons by the name of Dr. James Mar uh, Maroon, who did the surgeries on me, he told me that uh, he could see how hard I had trained and the kind of condition I was in, but he also saw the tremendous kind of abuse that mm. the back took. And when he did the, the couple of surgeries, he had to remove a total 
of 16 uh, uh, spurs on my back. Wow. And uh, three vertebrae that have been removed. And I still, you know, uh, j just a, a lot, a lot of uh, problems that uh, to this day I'm in much, much better shape. But to tell you that I'm totally pain free, mm. it wouldn't be accurate either. But thank God. I mean, I'm, I'm right. doing great. I work out and everything else. Right, right. Absolutely. Speaking of, uh, of lifting heavy guys, is it true that um, when you when you lifted Haystacks Calhoun, that's that's really what turned your career around? Well, it, it certainly helped me tremendously because up to that point, I couldn't uh, get any kind of a break. I, I just uh, couldn't couldn't get a break. I mean, no promoter wanted to take a chance and put me as a headliner, even though they thought that uh, certain things about me they were impressed as far as my strength, my physical appearance, and that. But in those days, they'd rather continue on with established names, mm -hmm. and it's pretty hard to get established if somebody <laughs> doesn't give you a break. Right. So when I picked up a stack. Calhoun, uh, then, uh, you know, it got such a tremendous reaction. The interviews have said is my favorite guest that I've ever had on here, and I have said it, and that is documented, making his fourth appearance on the show, unequivocally, professional wrestling's living legend and former two-time Triple WF World Heavyweight Champion, Bruno Sammartino. Bruno, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you very much, Eric. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be on your show, and thank you for the kind words. Oh, absolutely. It's always an honor having you here, and uh, always the first question I ask you is, how you doing? You still doing those morning runs? Yes, I still maintain six days. Uh, three uh, days a week I do uh, road work, and three days a week I pump iron. <laughs> some days my day of rest, but not really. That's the day I love to touch around the house with the grass or the shrubberies and all that kind of stuff. Right. Now, I saw some pictures of you from um, some conventions last year, and it looks like you, you lost some weight. Um, uh, right now, uh, about 217, 218. Somewhere around there. Wow. I, I, I don't think at, at your age there is a man in better shape in this country that I've ever seen. Well, I don't know. Thank you. I, I do work at it hard because, as you know, in wrestling all those years, I did uh, sustain some some injuries to where I'd have some back surgeries, hip surgery, knee surgeries. So I've done a lot of rehab on my own, and I believe, I'm a strong believer that if you work what you gonna do? You can't fight the future. Wrestling God. ProWrestlingRadio.com presents. Are you talking to me? Pro Wrestling Radio. Live. Online. You think The Rock actually cares? What is he doing here? Oh, it's true. I'm bringing everybody with me. Be awesome. That's hard time. But be the man. Call in with a question or comment. Six. One. Can you feel it? I hate your ever. Hold oh, the damn phone. Call three at 1-877-800-8834. That's how I roll. Your sex not the big dead. Come get some. Because I've done all of that. And now your host of the show. The king is back on his throne. Eric. Gargiulo. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. Welcome to a very special Memorial Day edition of Pro Wrestling Radio and a show that I am very excited about. So let's not waste any time. Let's bring up today's guest. We will have him for the entire program today. And at approximately 1230, we will open up the phone lines for your questions for my guest, the guy that I have routinely on... That I became known as the strong guy uh, from Abruzzi, Italy, who picked up Calhoun. And no question that that did help me considerably from that time forth. Right, right, absolutely. Now, uh, what what do you remember? How, how did you wind up meeting Vince McMahon Sr. for the first time? Was it through Frank Tunney? No, not at all. Uh, I, I was here in Pittsburgh. I had uh, I was competing. I, I was doing both amateur wrestling and professional wrestling. Mm. I, and I mean, uh, uh, amateur wrestling and amateur uh, weightlifting champ okay. uh, competition. And I had been in Oklahoma City where I became the North American weightlifting ch uh, title I won. And when I was here in Pittsburgh, I was on a television show from a fella that uh, that read in the paper that I'd won the contest. And while I was on that show, a gentleman by the name of Rudy Miller was in town from Washington D.C. because 
because the following day on a Saturday, they would do studio wrestling here in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And he happened to be here the night before, and he was, saw on TV while I was being interviewed about this weightlifting contest that I won. And the gentleman asked me if I was still also working out with the, you know, the wrestling part. Mm -hmm. And so when this uh, Rudy Miller heard about me doing both weightlifting and wrestling, he inquired at the studio if anybody knew who I was. And it happened that one of the guys, a guy by the name of John Cartonis, who went to high school with me, he says, yeah, he says, I live in the same street as Bruno. And this Rudy Miller asked him if...